So, okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, my presentation, uh, Engaging uh, Device Trees. Uh, I'll start with uh, saying something about myself. So my name is uh, Geert Uiterhoeven. I started working uh, on the Linux kernel about 20 years ago. It started as a hobbyist. Uh, I started with uh, port of uh, Linux to the M68K family, most specifically to uh, the Commodore Amiga platform. Um, then a few years later, uh, I got a, a PowerPC board. Um, that was about the time that uh, the Macintosh clones were supposed to come, and uh, uh, I started porting uh, Linux to it. But uh, in the end, that didn't really become very successful because at that time, uh, Apple decided to kill the Apple clones, the Mac clones, and most manufacturers of clones were not believing that Linux would be a viable alternative to sell those machines at that time. Uh, at about, about the same time, the frame buffer device uh, subsystem got uh, accepted in the mainline kernel, and uh, I was a uh, maintainer of that subsystem for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, in the meantime, I started working for Sony, and uh, at Sony I did various things. Not everything was Linux related, but in 2006 uh, I was part of the team that uh, worked on uh, uh, Linux for the PS3 and the cell processor. Um, and then finally, uh, last year I decided to uh, turn my hobby into uh, to my job, and I uh, founded my own uh, small uh, company. And since then, I've been doing uh, contract work for uh, RenSS, uh, working on their uh, ARM-based SOCs. Uh, I'm still uh, also working on Linux as a hobby. So during the last 20 years, I touch, touched uh, lots of parts inside uh, the kernel. Uh, I'm still maintainer of uh, M68K uh, architecture. So uh, in this presentation, uh, I will tell you where our device tree is coming from and what problems uh, that they solve and what challenges that they also pose. And then I will try to give you uh, some best practices to improve the bindings between IP cores in SOCs, uh, bindings for devices on boards and drivers. And the goal is to make it easier to support a vast variety of SOCs, boards and peripherals and also for uh, production kernels like uh, used by, uh, like used from the long-term support initiative. So first I'll start with a short history of where the uh, device trees are coming from. So uh, device trees are coming from uh, the open firmware, uh, firmware, which is some kind of BIOS for systems. So it all started with uh, the Sun Open Boot uh, firmware as used in uh, Spark Station 2. And a few years later, that was turned into uh, IEEE standard. In the meantime, the standard is uh, no longer valid, uh, but still device trees are used. Uh, in 1997, I had my first experience with device trees. That was on this PowerPC board uh, uh, from uh, the Common Hardware Reference Platform family. And it was actually a design from IBM, a reference design long trail. And this board had a real open firmware. Are there any people here in the room who have experience with real open firmware? Not that many. Any experience with device trees? That's a bad one. Uh, so uh, open firmware, there was uh, some BIOS-like firmware system. And it used uh, the Ford uh, programming language, which is a stack-based uh, language. Uh, it was originated on the Sun machines, but was also used at that time on uh, Apple Power Macs and on uh, big IBM machines. Uh, one thing special there is that it also represented the PCI devices in, uh, in the device tree. So it was generated by the firmware. The firmware uh, probed the PCI devices and created a device tree and nodes for them in the device trees. Uh, on the long trail, uh, ISA devices were also present and used uh, ISO PNP. And at that time, Linux didn't much use uh, device tree itself. There were some quick checks for uh, if it was compatible or if some device was present. Uh, that was about it. And in 2005, PowerPC started switching to the flattened device tree format, which was basically some uh, representation, some simpler representation of a device tree uh, created by uh, the device tree compiler. And then in 2006, we finally got the first DTS, device tree source file, in the kernel, 
for uh, an embedded board. In 2007, when I worked on the PS3, by that time, uh, device tree sources were mandatory in the PowerPC part of the kernel. So there was, PS3 had a device tree, but it was very rudimentary. It had some, some dummy memory and a CPU with a few threads. And since this presentation about device trees, I'm showing you one device tree source. This is about the only one that can fit on, uh, <laughs> on one screen. I even had to remove some stuff. Uh, but it shows one of the, a few of the basic things that you, you have a compatible entry for the machine, uh, size and address cells for a 64-bit machine. Memory was dummy because we got information from the firmware in some other way. One CPU with two threads. This is a little bit special, but at that time that was the only way how to represent multiple threads in uh, device tree. Uh, some dummy clock frequencies and uh, cache. That was all you needed as a device tree to boot a PS3. All the rest was still in, uh, in the hard-coded in the sources in some other form. In 2007, uh, people started to uh, combine the implementation that we had for PowerPC and Spark, because Spark was still also using uh, a device tree, but then based on the, the real open firmware uh, from Sun. And the code was consolidated in drivers OF. In 2009, we got the first new architecture that started using device tree, which was MicroBlaze. And at about that time, people were thinking about enforcing uh, device tree only for new architectures, but uh, that's still not really the case. And in 2011, something very important happened, that is that ARM switched to device tree. That was mostly in response to Linux complaining about all the, the churn in the code. Does anyone know in what kernel version that was? I looked it up. No, I looked it up for this presentation, and it's, it's funny that I never noticed before, but it was V3.0. So that was probably the reason why Linus uh, started changing the numbering. <laughs> and today, device tree is used by 12 out of the 28 architectures we have support for in the kernel. And the next one that's coming soon, uh, NEOS 2, will also have it. So device tree is getting everywhere. Now is the question, what are device trees? There are the description of the hardware. Uh, probably, uh, well, I hope most of you attended also Thomas' presentation about the device tree for, uh, for dummies. So you know already a bit about it. So it des describes the hardware and the relationships between the various components he has F on the in the system, both on the system on chip as on the, the board. And uh, it's OS agnostic, which means that it's not tied to Linux. It's also used by other operating systems like BSD. And why do we need this device tree? That's a very good question. What problems does it, it solve? And are there other solutions? So let us just first look at a simple computer like most of you know from a long time ago. So you just have a CPU, a bus with some I.O. peripherals, and memory. Very simple, everything look, runs at the same voltage level, usually five volt at that time, just one single clock, very simple. Uh, if you write OS for this or software, then it's really tight, was usually really tied to the hardware. You wrote the software just for this computer. Expansion cards are a bit tricky because yeah, you don't know what kind of card it is, so you need some way to probe for it, or something like that. Now if you move to a a more uh, recent PC, then we, you have a, a, still have a CPU with the bus and memory, but now you have a PCI host bridge with the PCI bus, I.O. devices, some USB host bridge for, uh, to support USB devices. And one important thing here is that now you suddenly have discovery, auto discovery on the buses. So with PCI you can probe for what devices are present on the system. That's very convenient. The same with USB. You plug in a USB device, all devices have IDs, the system knows exactly what kind of devices you have. On a PC like this, you, you may still have some legacy devices on the ISA bus that you may have to probe for, but uh, 
most of, if most of it is on PCI and USB. That's very simple. So that was about the, how a PC looked at the end of the 20th century. So from the hardware point of view, it was mostly complete to move from hardwired logical blocks to discoverable buses like PCI and USB. You still had some ISA, you, they invented uh, ISA PNP to solve the issue with probing on, on ISA. So, and at that time, Linux, uh, the state of Linux was that there was no device framework yet, no platform devices. Uh, most uh, kernels were meant for one single platform. Uh, there were some architectures that supported multi-platform from the beginning, but it was mostly M68K and some PowerPC at that time. Uh, it relied a lot on PC PCI discovery. It's automatic, no problems. Still some ISA probing. If you built a kernel for non, non x86, then you had to leave out those drivers because they may uh, cause crashes on your system. That's what uh, happened on most embedded platforms that didn't have ISA buses. Don't enable those drivers for legacy floppy or something like that, or it will die. And uh, at the time, we, we also started seeing live CDs like Knopix that allowed you to just insert a CD, boot a PC, thanks to PCI discovery and USB discovery, everything worked out of the box and you had a working system. Nice. Now let's go to embedded. So a, a simple system on chip looks very similar to a simple computer. You have a CPU, you have some, a bus with I.O. blocks and memory, but that's usually not included. Then SOCs got more complex. Let's add more CPU cores. Well, still not that complicated. Add a few more buses with bridges between them, lots of I.O. devices. Uh, SOCs typically also have a GPIO block that controls, uh, so you can use your uh, pins on the ship as GPIO, which is nice for LEDs, but also for, for, for other things and for input. Uh, so now you have lots of I.O. Blo uh, I.O. blocks, GPIO, but one of the technical limitations on the SOC is the, the amount of pins you can get on, on the system. So, so uh, a SOC is a 2D object, while the number of pins, but you can have BGA, then it's still 2D. But you, you have to route all the signals to over uh, across the, the board. So in the end, you have the problem that you have a 2D of functionality on the ship, and you have 1D of pins outside. So let's add a pin mux with pin control on the system. So you can basically uh, configure which I.O. blocks are connected to which pins and which pins are used for GPIO or not. And as you see, this is getting more complicated. Now add uh, some clocks, a clock uh, system on the ship that can uh, generate multiple clocks for the d different I.O. modules. Uh, let's add multiple power domains with, uh, that you can turn, so you can turn off some components to save power. And you see that you get a really complicated thing. There's no way you're gonna run a kernel here on this and try to probe what devices are present on it. So you need a, a good way to describe the hardware. And that's what device trees are. It gets even more complicated when you put this SOC on the board. You have board devices on SPI bus, I2C, uh, I2C is still a bit uh, probable because you, you can probe for all the I2C slave IDs. SPI is not. Uh, you can have, uh, there are other buses, so it's getting really, really, really complicated to support this. So I call this the return of the non-discoverable buses. So in the evolution of the computer, we moved from non-discoverable buses to buses like PCI and USB. And now we're moving back to buses that do not support auto discovery. So we have lots of hardwired logic on the ship, complicated topologies like buses behind buses. We have power domains with power regulators to turn off uh, components we don't use to save power. We have lots of different clock generators because not all components run at the same frequency. Uh, interrupt controllers that can be cascaded or not. Uh, pin control, you see getting complicated. We still may use PCI and USB for some expansion devices, but uh, that's it. So to run a Linux kernel on a board, it needs to know what hardware it has. So it needs a good description of the hardware. So early systems for that were uh, 
so machine types uh, numbers or a, a tagged boot info system like we had on uh, M68K and on ARM. So and this forms some ABI between the bootloader and the kernel. So the bootloader can t tell the kernel you're running on this device and you have on this system and you have these devices. That's it. Uh, later when we got uh, platform devices with the device framework, these things got added to board code. And thanks to that we got lots of large source files with, with big structures uh, describing uh, what was on the board. It was, it was actual C code, uh, complex, it's boring, it's easy to make mistakes there. We did have some advantages in some form because it seed you had some type checking which you don't have in device tree. And then later we got device trees which provides a better separation of code and data. So the device tree source is actual data that you put in a, in a, in a text file. Another alternative is uh, ACPI. Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. Device trees are also uh, very convenient for uh, multi-platform kernels. So with a single platform kernel, you first configure your kernel for the platform, and then you, you run that. If you have n different devices, you need n configs and n kernels. And that's getting uh, annoying. Now, if you have a multi-platform kernel, you can differentiate by the device tree, not by the config. So in theory, you could have, uh, for n devices, only one config, and then run it and one kernel and run it on n devices using n different device trees. It's easier to deploy. It's also very convenient for distributions. We only have to provide one kernel. And it also uh, helps with compile coverage. So before, if you have wanted to compile, to check coverage of, uh, of the compilation for the kernel source, you had to compile n different kernels. Now you have only to compile one or one per family. So if you look at uh, how many different dev configs ARM used to have, this graph shows it that uh, in 2.6.11, which was the start of the Git history in 2005, early 2006, there were about 50 dev configs for ARM. And here we got uh, the highest number there was 179, somewhere uh, around the time that Linus was complaining about uh, complexity of ARM, and then later, this is, people already started cleaning up the dev configs before our DT came, because this is about the point where ARM switched to DT. And if you see, it's very interesting. So before we had this uh, steep curve, and then here it's almost flat. And what does it mean? No support got added for new ARM boards? No, it means that people started consolidating the dev configs thanks to DT. So while the current 2614 supports many more different platforms than uh, I think it's 2639. That's the amount of dev configs in the kernel source tree is still the same. So for compile coverage, that's uh, more convenient. <coughs> Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> So device trees are also very convenient for uh, reuse, both of hardware or software, because current SOCs, they are usually built from uh, lots of IP cores, but they're not always different. So many IP cores are shared between different SOCs or different SOC families. It's a bit like Lego building blocks. So you could support multiple SOCs with the same kernel that has the same drivers. We just need different DTs that explain how uh, well which IP cores are used in which SOC and uh, how many of, of each of them you have in the system. Uh, it also helps for reuse of boards because uh, many boards use the same SOCs, so, uh, so usually they differ only in, in a few components, uh, so you can uh, reuse there. Uh, so the only difference there are which IP blocks are enabled shell devices you have uh, on, on, on buses on the, on the board, like SPI and uh, I2C devices, clocks uh, and regulators. Pin control is different because uh, on different boards, different pins may be used for different purposes. 
device three is also pose some uh, challenges. Uh, before we had SOCs, uh, hardware blocks were typically uh, ICs. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, early 70s or something like that, where hardware blocks were made of uh, lots, multiple ICs, but uh, more like uh, end of the 80s or beginning of the 90s, that one uh, Ethernet controller was just a single chip, for example. So a hardware block is just a single chip. Uh, it has a unique part number. Usually, the, it's unique. Uh, some vendors, it was not always the case. They may change the, the chip and still use the same uh, uh, part number. Uh, if, if it was a PCI uh, chip, then it had a PCI ID, uh, which was, could also be used to differentiate. And each chip, it had, an, had a, yeah, a part number and a name, like, for, like a typical example is a, a Tulip Ethernet controller. So if a later revision of the hardware came with new features, you usually had a new part number, a new part PCI ID, and a new name. So it's easy to differentiate between the, the hardware blocks. Now with SOCs, it's different. So you have an SOC, and it contains lots of hardware blocks, and there are no part numbers for the individual hardware blocks inside the SOC. You just have a, a part number for the SOC itself. It's sometimes difficult to know what IP cores are, are present in, in a particular uh, SOC. Uh, sometimes they do have names, but and the name doesn't always mean that it's exact, exactly the same like a component with the same name in an older version SOC. So uh, yeah, it can be difficult. How do, do you reference a specific version of IP block? You can, you could, for example, use the SOC part number or family name or version. And uh, actually, we, we used both of these. Uh, well, all of these for, for some components. So uh, one ex example with, uh, with the abstract name is the SCIF A uh, serial uh, UART for, uh, that's present in some Renesas SOCs. Uh, for Ethernet, we typically use the Ether with the uh, with the number of with the, the part number for the SOC, uh, we have for GPIO we we have one GPIO driver that covers multiple uh, GPIO controllers in the same SOC family, and then for sound is another example that uses a, a version number inside the family. But this is getting more more and more uh, complicated. Uh, for soft cores, it can sometimes be easier if you have the HDL source for the IP core, then you know exactly what you have inside your SOC. And uh, for example, for uh, OpenRISC, they uh, standardized on uh, this naming scheme where you have uh, the name, which is the name of the, the component, and then you have a, a version, which comes from uh, the open course subversion system. It's also not that convenient because these days many people use Git repositories. So if, if you would, for example, try an open risk on OrbSoc, then you have a, a Git commit ID for the whole HDL source tree, which contains multiple components. Uh, I, mean, looked, I looked a bit into getting a decent uh, DTS for uh, one of the open risk uh, implementations. And uh, yeah, I still have to look in and dive into the sources to find out which RTL version corresponds to the one version I have in the source tree I'm using. But it's even more uh, complicated with uh, SOCs from, uh, from vendors where you don't have the HDL sources, because then you don't know what's inside. Perhaps it would be a good idea if uh, uh, SOCs had, uh, each component inside the SOC had a read-only register that uh, advertises the version that you have. Ideally, it would perhaps be a, a git commit ID of the, the HDL sources of that uh, IP core, so we can easily differentiate between the different versions. So if you have two versions of an IP core, uh, there can be some cases. If they're definitely different, then it's easy. And yeah? you know that you have to handle it differently. And the only question is to remains, remains how do you represent the differences inside the device tree? You could have two versions that are different, but they only differ in some small aspects that, Linux, that the current Linux kernel driver doesn't care about. So you could use the same compatible name there, but it may not be a good idea because in the future you may uh, change the driver and make use of the feature you have on only one version of them. So you definitely need to differentiate there. 
And in some cases, you have the same IP core, the same version of the IP core in two different SOCs, and you, you're happy. And then the question is, are they really the same? So in the past, it turned, it turned out that some versions that were considered the same were not really the same. And then you have issues later. So if you, your device tree says that they're both compatible, then, then you have an issue. So how can you handle uh, multiple versions? Uh, you can have uh, first generic names. Uh, you, you have just the vendor name and a, a device name. And you can have a specific name. So if your DTS says that you're compatible with the generic name and both with the specific name, that for example also includes the SOC type, then you can have start with a driver that matches the generic name and that's, that's fine. Now, if you later get a SOC that uses the same IP core, or you think it's the same one, then in the DDS for that one, you can uh, still put a generic name here, and you can use a new specific type that uses the new SOC type. So as long as everything is compatible, the driver doesn't need any changes because it will match against this. But thanks to this one, you have opportunity for changing things if you find out that there's an incompatibility. Now, if you get a new incompatible SOC with a slightly different IP core that needs uh, changes in the driver or a completely new dri driver, then you just use this one with the SOC specific type and you do not specify the generic one. So the old driver will still match against the generic one and the old SOC type. And if you write a new driver or you enhance the old driver, you will make sure that that matches against this and everything will work fine. Now I will talk a bit about the stable ABIs for uh, device trees. So inside the kernel, there's a, a stable ABI nonsense rule. So uh, in kernel code does not have a stable ABI. Module, module ABI is not stable. Uh, platform data inside uh, uh, used with platform devices, it's also not stable. Uh, we don't care much about out of tree code. Uh, the advantage here is that you, that you can refactor uh, and improve the code inside the kernel uh, without having to keep in, uh, having to add a compati backwards compatibility for, for old uh, ABIs or something like that. The kernel only has a stable ABI for uh, the user, a a user space. Uh, the advantage there is that user space ABI is small. It uh, considers only a few well-taught abstractions like uh, system calls and some files in sys uh, used with uh, sysfs. Uh, device tree API is also stable, but this is completely different with the user space API in a few aspects. Uh, first of all, it's big. It's much bigger than uh, syscalls, for example. And it's growing, and it has a few orders of magnitudes more changes than the cha uh, changes to system calls. There are zillions of different hardware devices, and device tree bindings can be very complex for complex hardware. It's complex to re review them. Uh, they are all reviewed on a single mailing list. People uh, who do that have a, a hard job. So, uh, they're doing a good job, but there's that much go to review, and it's that complex, and there are that many devices, so it's easy for to make uh, mistakes or miss something. So the stable DT API, it's uh, more complicated than the system call API, for example. Uh, yeah, in the past we had uh, some issues with the compatibility. Uh, and a recent example was that. Uh, we had a new optional property for, uh, to indicate that uh, an SPI uh, slave device could do uh, supported quad SPI. Uh, and yeah, it's DT, so it looked like it's nicely optional. But I internally, the code set a flag based on, the pro uh, the based on whether this property was present. And then it turns out that the SPI core rejects 
slaves if the slave has this set and the master does not support it yet. So it means that if you tell your device tree that your slave supports Quad SPI and your driver for the SPI master doesn't support it yet, then it will not work anymore. So a new DT with an old kernel will not work. So uh, we just got that fixed. Uh, another issue with compatibility is if you want to, if you move <laughs> from uh, device specific to generic subsystem properties, uh, for example, we had a, a run as a specific clock indices property in a device tree, and then lately we, a similar one got uh, introduced at a generic subsystem level, so now we want to migrate it from the run as a specific one to the generic one, but it's, that doesn't turn out to be that simple, because you have to update the bindings, you have to update the subsystem code, but you cannot do that before the bindings get accepted. Uh, you need backwards compatibility code because you want to run your old DTs with new kernels. Uh, and then you have to update the actual device trees and add the new, the new generic property and perhaps remove the old one or will we not do that or will we keep it? Uh, so it's a bit uh, tricky and it can take quite some time uh, to, to really get rid of old properties. If you can even drop them at all, because the DT ABI is supposed to be stable. Uh, yeah, so there are currently plans to move the internal device trees and the bindings to external repository. Uh, well, I'm a bit skeptical about it. We'll see uh, how it goes, uh, because it may, well, it may complicate things and make the turnaround time for change is even larger than it is now. Well, well we will see. We had uh, big changes uh, in the past in the Linux kernel and we always managed to cope with them, so probably do. Another challenge of uh, device tree is uh, a complex the complex topologies we can have in, in SOCs. Uh, one example we had there is that uh, on one of the Renesas SECs, we have a, a USB module that actually has to change its function depending on the state of GPIO. And so the USB can either be a USB host or a USB device, and that's indicated by the GPIO. How do you re represent things like that in, uh, in DT? So with platform devices, you had a, a callback function in the platform data, but with DT you cannot do that like that. Uh, device tree bindings for graphics and audio and other multimedia can also be very complicated because the many buses that are involved there, you can have uh, controls over I2C and actual video data transferring over some other bus and then different encoders, decoders uh, can also be uh, a challenge. Uh, Another issue is uh, that where do, do you have your DDB stored? So uh, originally it's created from uh, DT source files by the device tree compiler and ideally it's passed by the bootloader. But where does the bootloader get it? Uh, how is it updated if you ever want to update it at all? There's backwards compatibility. Uh, you can append it to the kernel image or embedded in the kernel image, and then it's always up to date. It sounds very attractive for developers, but for products in the field, it's, uh, it's different. Um, these days, people are also working on uh, device trees overlays. That's actually a means to, uh, to change the device tree in a dynamic way. Uh, it's used, for example, on the BeagleBone Black and the BeagleBone Black, where you have a K plugin boards. So you have a device tree for the, the basic board, and if you add an add-in board, some uh, device tree overlay becomes active that can add devices or disable devices on the original system, which sounds like a really uh, powerful thing to do. On uh, FPGA platforms. Uh, it's getting a bit more complicated because yeah, do you have a fixed device tree? The hardware may change, you can reprogram it. Uh, so perhaps we should uh, derive the, 
device tree from the HDL, and I think that's something that they're doing on uh, on Microblaze that uh, they generate the device tree sources from the actual ADL sources. Okay, so now I will uh, show some uh, back best practices for uh, improving your uh, device tree experience. Uh, the documentation uh, for the bindings uh, that you write, you should always submit it early together with the actual driver code to the device tree mailing list for review. So uh, to make the chances slimmer that there are uh, stupid mistakes. Uh, note that this uh, mailing list was ch has changed last summer. Uh, it also means at the side effect that uh, there seems to be a, a, a short period last summer where, for where there were no mailing uh, list archives for the, the discussions there, which was a pity because I was looking for something uh, that was discussed at the time. Um, for several of the properties in, uh, in a device tree node, uh, you can have optional names. Uh, that's the case for registers, interrupts, and clocks. Um, if you have multiple of them, it's very convenient to use the names because else you create some, some implicit dependency on, on, on the order, which can be a bit confusing sometimes. Uh, an example here is that uh, for a device that has three interrupts, you could get away with just having the interrupts property only, but it's, it's easier for the reviewer and for the code if you have a, a separate uh, interrupt names uh, uh, property. That's also very handy if uh, you have a, uh, an IP core that, has that can have multiple interrupts on one uh, SOC or just one shared multiplexed interrupt on another SOC. So if you use the interrupt names, then it's easy to uh, distinguish there. Um, and if you have uh, multiple compatible entries in your bindings, you have a generic one and you have uh, SOC specific ones, please al always put all the SOC specific ones in the device tree documentation as well, uh, even if the driver doesn't use them yet, uh, because this will allow Checkpatch to uh, validate uh, your device tree sources against uh, documentation, because these days Checkpatch will uh, check all compatible entries in your device tree source and it will try to look them up in the findings in documentation directory. Yeah, one question on that. Do you know, is it possible to listen to one for IGC devices? Uh, I'm sorry? Have you tried listening to more than one compatible for IGC devices? Uh, yeah, so the question is, is it possible to have more than two compatible entries for I2C devices? Uh, yeah, I2C devices are a bit special uh, because they don't think they use the vendor prefixes. Eh? It's, it's just the trivial uh, devices there. No, you're allowed to use the vendor prefixes. I'm sorry? If you add um, the device tree bindings to the I2C driver, you are allowed. Ah, yeah, then you use the vendor, but in actual driver, there are no vendor prefixes. Uh, version of the code doesn't use vendor prefixes. Proper OF version of I2C device will. So I don't know whether it works with multiple compatible entries. I, I hope so. So you can, you just need to put the compatible strings as an explicit compatible OF thing in the driver of the line in the I2C. Ah, yeah, by default, it relies on the name in the platform device and not in the array that you have in the platform device. Yeah, so if you have the array in the platform device, it works. Okay, good to know that. Um, uh, for the device tree bindings, it's similar as for code and, des and designs for computer systems in general, keep it simple. So try to have bindings that specify compatible value and just a few properties. Uh, some people like to add more properties to differentiate, but it it's, will become uh, a problem if in the future you, d you find out that uh, the devices are not that compatible and that you have to add more properties, which is worse. And so it's better to use uh, this, the compatible entry for that. Uh, There's a quote from Olaf uh, about 
that you you should start simple and that it's always possible to to make some small changes by adding properties if needed later. Uh, for SOCs and SOCs on boards, uh, you can have a separate uh, de uh, a device tree source for the board and uh, device tree source includes files for the SOC. So in the, the ones for, for the SOC that are includes files, they are usually have the extension DDSI. So they uh, contain the SOC specific devices and you want to list uh, to mention uh, all of them there, uh, not caring about pin control and what de what uh, devices are actually enabled on the the real uh, board. So you list all devices there, and you put them there with status disabled, so they're not enabled. Uh, an example for this is uh, is a device node for a serial ATA device. You have the it's uh, the compatible entry registers, interrupt clocks, and the status of the device is disabled. Then on the board specific uh, DTS, uh, which ends with the DTS extension, you can include the SOC specific uh, DTSI, and you enable the devices that you care about. You add uh, shell devices for SPI and I2C that you have on the board. Uh, external clocks, whatever, pin control, aliases, voltage regulators, uh, can even more, have more of that. So an example here is uh, for an I2C node, it enables the I2C node that was present in the, in the DTSI files and it specifies an additional property like for example a clock frequency. Uh, about uh, including, uh, since Recently, uh, device tree sources changed to using the C preprocessor. So it means that you can now use the standard C uh, hash include. Uh, and that is pre this is preferred over the old uh, include like this. Uh, this also allows you to have uh, definitions in header files. These are stored in uh, include DD bindings. And you can include them by a DTS or also by code if needed. Uh, whether you re really need to include them from code, it's uh, debatable because in, in some cases, it, yeah. the DTS is supposed to describe the hardware and the code. Why does it need uh, to, know, to know this information? Uh, it can be useful for clock indices or for other boring definitions, interrupts. Uh, a valid example is, for example, for, for GP, GPIO. Uh, so you don't have to write everywhere that Active high is zero and active low is one, which could be a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, so it's good to have the defines there. But if you use include files, keep in mind that the actual values that you have in include files are also part of the DT ABI. So you cannot change them later. Uh, now I will tell a bit about uh, how you can have platform devices and uh, DT and uh, let them operate uh, together. Because in, sometimes you still want to use platform devices. You can have, for example, uh, drivers for IP cores that are also used on legacy platforms that do not support uh, device tree yet. Uh, you may wa want to start with platform devices for prototyping. Uh, yeah, you want to start with, la uh, with legacy platforms. But even if you're working on a legacy platform that doesn't support DT, think about the upgrade part because you may have to add D DT support to it later. So it's always a good idea to keep that in mind. So if you look at the differences between platform devices and uh, device tree devices, so platform devices, they are matched by the platform device name. A platform device also contains resources for uh, uh, programmed I.O., memory mapped I.O., IRQs, and uh, an optional pointer to a platform data struct. This is a C struct. So it means that it can contain anything that you have in C, which is uh, flexible, but also a bit dangerous can put, for example, put callback functions there, uh, which is something for which you don't have an easy upgrade part with DT. If it's just integer values, that's okay. You can have properties for that uh, in DT later. So from the other side for DT, you match by the compatible property. And uh, you have register properties for, uh, for uh, 
I/O addresses, uh, interrupt properties for interrupts, clocks for clocks, pin control for pin control, and then you may have platform, subsystem, bus, and device-specific properties which fulfill about the same uh, function as the platform data in platform devices. Uh, one generic rule is to try to avoid platform data because it can be complicated to convert that to DT later. Uh, callback functions, they are I mentioned it before, they are a bad example, yes, please? Yeah, if it's just data, then it's fine. But don't try to put m too many properties there because if you want to do the same thing in DT, it can become messy. Uh, especially because for platform data, there's no stable ABI. So if you need to add a field, you can just do it, submit it with the driver, and it's in the next kernel version, and everything is fine. You don't have backwards compatibility, while in DT, uh, you, you do have that. Uh, an example here is when we added support for one, uh, for one more version of the Renesas SPI controller. So originally the plan was that we would add a number of chip selects and a few other flags to indicate something. But in the end, uh, I decided not to go that route and the only field that, uh, that was added was the number of chip selects and the rest was handled by using a different uh, compatible entry. Um, Typically, with platform devices, people matched against a single string and used the platform data to differentiate. But even with platform devices, you can have multiple platform names. And this allows the, to make it more similar, to have your code more similar for platform devices and for uh, device tree devices. Because uh, in, uh, in both the uh, OF device ID, which contains the compatible entry, and in the platform device ID, which contains the, the name of the platform devices, there's a, a pointer to, to data that you can put, you can put there wh whatever you want. It can be parameters. An example here is the first one is for platform devices. You have multiple names of platform devices, and then you have here a, a structure that tells more about the specific properties of uh, the actual device variant. And you can have the same thing in the DT code in the driver. So instead of adding more fields to the platform data, you differentiate by different platform device names, and that makes it easier to convert it later to a device tree. One other advice is that uh, using resources is, uh, is, is good in platform devices because they're automatically compatible between platform devices and device trees. Uh, even with platform devices, you can have named resources, uh, which can sometimes be interesting. Uh, yeah, I mentioned before uh, the example where you have uh, multiple interrupts uh, on one version of the IP core or one single multiplexed interrupt on uh, another version. So by, use, by having the names there, you can uh, easily differentiate. And then the driver can use platform get IRQ by name to find out whether you have a a MUX interrupt or you have the individual interrupts on a different version of the, the IP core. Uh, for clocks, uh, you can also make it uh, compatible. Uh, if there's a single clock and you use the clock get with uh, the null uh, name, because uh, with the null name, the match, uh, the clock is matched using the platform device name in the platform case and using the DT node name, which is the, the address of the, oops, um, which is the address of the device node and the name of the node, if you have DT without a common clock framework. And uh, if you have DT with a common clock framework, it will match against uh, the clock name that you have in the DT. So if you use clock get with null, then it will work in all those cases automatically, which is uh, interesting for compatibility. Uh, one final thing here is uh, the long-term uh, support initiative. Uh, I don't know whether some of you went to the presentation from uh, Munakata-san and uh, uh, Shibata-san. Uh, 
in the long-term uh, support kernel, um, we backport uh, drivers, SOC, and board support. And uh, since we care about multi-platform there, uh, it uses DT2. So uh, compatibility of uh, device trees is uh, very important there. And uh, to get, so it's important that uh, the drivers, uh, bindings that we submit are, that we, that they are accepted early so we, so they can be backported to the LTSI kernel as well. Uh, and there it's important to find a good balance between early bindings and uh, having to avoid long-term support of potentially premature bindings uh, because you, know, you will have to support them for uh, the next 10 years, maybe. And it would also be good uh, that uh, DTSs that you have and that work with LTSI 3.10 would also work with uh, the future LTSI kernel. But, uh, that's still to be seen. Okay, so uh, I would like to thank uh, Renaissance Electronics Corporation for uh, contacting me to do uh, all this interesting Linux kernel work, uh, the Linux Foundation for organizing the conference and allowing me to present here. The other people in the Renaissance Linux kernel team, because we have these uh, interesting insights and discussions about DT. And of course, the whole Linux kernel community, because we're having so much fun working together on this fun operating system. Thanks. Uh, now we come to the questions. Are there any questions? What's your experience in, in having an uh, existing device tree work with the newer kernel? Uh, well, uh, I don't. Yeah, uh, the question is uh, do, I, do I have much experience in reusing old uh, device trees with recent kernels? Uh, Actually, I don't have much experience uh, in this area, so the, the boards we're working on, uh, some of the device tree bindings are still uh, under construction and to be finalized, so we have device trees that don't cover all components on the board. Uh, but we do our best to make it compatible. Uh, yeah, the, the clock indices example, for example, is uh, something that shows that we we do care about the compatibility there and that it should still work. Any other questions? Does this mean that you plan on, when you release the original, you plan on testing all the device trees of the previous kernel releases? Like, we release 3.15, you're going to test everything with 3.14, 3.30, well, yeah, so the, so the question is, will we just keep on testing the, the new device trees with all the old kernel ver versions and vice versa? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe when somebody complains that it's not working, that we will try it and, and see if we can fix it. But uh, yeah. it's a, Do you do that? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Actually, I recently had to introduce some backward compatibility code. It was very simple, like just an else if just trying to handle the default case, and I was pretty sure that it was correct. And then later on, I actually tested, and it was, and it was a really, really simple case. Like I don't remember, but a new property being added, and I wanted to uh, save all the backward. I don't remember the exact case, but it was really, really simple, and it was wrong. Yeah. yeah. So until I tested. What was broken for? What did you do? Uh, if I remember correctly, is that we had a limited understanding of the hardware and we had chosen a chrome based address for an IT block. So we had to, it was like too high, so we had to shift it by like um, 256 bytes back. So basically, what I was doing is that if the compatible uh, uh, string was the old one, it was like subtracting that amount from, from the base address, which is fairly trivial. It's just if all compatible strings subtract, and I don't remember exactly how I got that wrong, but it did got it wrong. And uh, I didn't test until some point, but I'm pretty sure that the testing effort in order to keep back the penalty is enormous. Yeah, we'll see how uh, well it goes with a stable DT, because this DT is not that old. <laughs> 
yet to we don't have 10 years of experience with uh, compatibility of device trees. So. Okay. Any other questions? Actually, I'm just following on with that point. Is that now we have a DT that's kernel. All bug reports need to know which version of DT you booted which version of the kernel. Because now you've got two different sets of variables. What could be causing a problem? Yeah, so the, the comment is that you, know, you have different version. You, you have to know what version of the kernel, what version of the DT you have when there is a bug. So yeah, it's easier if you can keep the DT and the kernel together. Right? <laughs> it's sort of the com backward compatibility problem. But we ran into this with iBank. It's the version DT shifts that they use that works with pretty much everything up to about point eight, and something changed in the topology. Yeah, once you have found the issue, you have to add backwards compatibility code, and I'm also a bit afraid that we that code will keep on growing and growing and growing. And yeah, then you can't build the old kernels. Yeah. I have pretty much the same remark uh, and I would like to, to add to the room is that somebody here in this room sure that he can run the old DT back in the 3.2 maybe with his new kernel? I would like to know. <laughs> yes? Yes. Great. For the legacy code. <laughs> so I don't want to point that I guess the PowerPC and Spark people, they have some experience in running running new kernels on old firmwares. So actually, last week, people were discussing workarounds related to the long trail board while mine died, I think, in 2004. So, But they're still working on the workarounds. On more mature architectures with old firmware or old device streams, I'm pretty sure they're not. A lot of it's true of the firmware not yeah, indeed, the firmware doesn't change, the hardware doesn't change, so it just, uh, let's hope the kernel code doesn't change in some incompatible way. Yeah. So what's your opinion on uh, output tree code in the bindings? Mm -hmm. what? What was it? Uh, output tree code, if you would have an output tree driver, it's on the right, and matches this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. what kind of driver? Out of tree drivers. Uh, <laughs> Out of three doesn't exist, huh? <laughs> I think everybody here wants to have everything in three. So I would say you can submit your findings even if you don't submit your driver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Proposal. <laughs> Indeed, it's related to a discussion we had at lunch, but uh, I'm not going to say more about it because that would spoil the fun. <laughs> I was just about to say that uh, device is not just useful for Linux. There's other systems that use the same. Uh, I'm working with security there, which uses the device tree kernel to work out what fit, what rights to grant to grant that kernel. So it's 
useful information to have about the perspectives or other operating systems? Uh, yeah, BSD uses it, but. And say, so ah, you. More questions? Nobody nobody asked that one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.